All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Mathematical Methods. Uh, so, uh, in the previous lecture, I had started talking about uh, the regular representation of a group. And the regular representation is a very special representation. Um, so, it we obtain it by assuming that we can treat each group element as uh, a basis vector in some vector space. And so this vector space um, is of dimension uh, is of dimension n, which is the order of the group. So remember, when we talk about group representations, what is a group representation? It is the action of, the, of, of a group on some vector space. So once you pick the vector space, that fixes the dimensionality of the representation because the representation matrices have to be operators which act on that vector space. So since we have picked our vector space to be of dimension of the order of the group, our group, our representation matrices will be of the same dimensionality. Now, we can assume, let's assume what, what is the action of the, of this, of the group on this, on this vector space. So, we, this, so this is our axiom, this is our assumption, right? And so we make the assumption that this is the manner in which uh, the group elements act on basis vectors, right? What do they do? They take any basis vector and they map it to another basis vector, right? So basically what they're doing is, uh, D of G is just taking one basis vector and mapping it to another basis vector of the group. Right? So what the action of this group does is basically it just permutes all the elements of the of these basis vectors, right? It just it just performs a permutation on all of these elements because the ith element goes to the jth element, the jth goes to the kth and so forth, right? So this, this matrix D of G, it has to be a permutation matrix. It has to be something which generates permutations on N elements. And before that, you can also check that this satisfies the, the group uh, multiplication property. And so it, it, it's, it is a representation of the group. Now, what is a, what is a permutation matrix look like? Right? A permutation matrix is something which takes elements of some list and just exchanges them, right? So what should be the form of a permutation matrix? Uh, let me just write that over here. What should be the form of a permutation matrix? So what does the, what does the permutation do? If you have a permutation phi, phi is a permutation and it acts on some set of elements, right? A1, A2, An, what does it do? It sends this set back to itself, right? It sends it to Ai1, Ai2, Ain. Where this set of indices, you have this set of indices I1, I2 and Ian, is 
the permutation of the is the is the effect of the permutation on your indices on one to n, right? So, as an example, right? If you consider permutation acting uh, on three elements, right? This is one permutation, right? And if you have if you have three different elements, uh, let's say v one, v two, and v three, you have the corresponding permutation would be given by v three, v two, and v one, right? So the indices have have been mixed in the manner given, you know, in, denoted by this permutation. Right, so you are taking what does the permutation do? It takes a n an object which has n uh, items and sends it to another of the same object which has n items but in a different order, right? So we can write this permutation as a matrix, right? Pi i j, it acts on the vector v j, right? Sum of j is equal to one to n to give you v prime i, right? So this pi is a n by n matrix, right? Now, what should be the form of this matrix? So, if you think about it for a little bit, you can you will realize. That this matrix can only have in each row and in each column, there can only be one element which is non zero. And all the other elements have to be zero. Right? Why is that? Well, because Let's say that in this row, for instance, I have two elements which are non-zero, okay? Let's say, let's say this is the i-th co column and this is the j-th column. So when I multiply it by my vector, right, I will get my output V1 prime. Now, if you see what is V1 prime, V1 prime is going to be, if you multiply this, this row vector with this, with this column, what will you get? You will get, you will get VI plus VJ, right? But we don't want that, right? Because this is not a permutation. We want V1 prime to be some other element of this list. So that means you cannot have more than one element in the matrix in any row or column, which is non-zero, right? So this is what the regular representation is. Now, the regular representation we can, it's a reducible representation. So we can take an element of this matrix and write it as a sum over all the possible reducible, irreducible representations of the group. So here, this index mu labels the different irreducible representations of the group. And a mu is the degeneracy, the number of times that representation occurs in this vector, uh, in this uh, direct sum. 
now we can take the trace of both sides so if we take the trace of both sides d of g what do we get on the right side we get sum over mu a mu trace of d d mu g okay and if you are not sure about how you go from this from this expression to this expression the right hand side you can remind yourself what does the block decomposition look like right this is what it looks like right it's a bunch of matrices which are, are arranged along the diagonal so when you take the trace of both of these sides you will be taking the trace of this matrix plus the trace of this matrix plus the trace of this matrix and on the others so this direct sum right over here this becomes a sum over all the all the matrices in this in the which form the uh, you know the bigger matrix so we can write the left hand side as a character of g and the right hand side as the sum of the characters of the same group element in the different representations okay now remember that we talked about what this in the last class that when you take the trace of the identity element in the regular representation you get the order of the group and when you take the trace of any other element which is not the identity you get you get zero if g is not equal to e okay so we will need this now what is this a mu right this a mu is telling me how many times each representation each irreducible representation occurs in this regular representation so we want to find out this a mu right and to do that we can use the character orthogonality theorem character orthogonality theorem what was the character orthogonality theorem it it was the following statement right that if you have two different representations for two different uh representations of the group g right and we label those representations uh by some indices mu and nu you can construct the characters of each group element right right and this set of characters what is this this is uh this forms a vector this forms a vector which is of size n which is equal to the order of the group right because for each element of the group for each element of the group you get a you get a separate character and so the orthogonality theorem says the following 
that if you take the inner product of these these characters and you sum over all the group elements right what do you get you get uh, the order of the group multiplied by d mu times delta d uh, delta mu nu what is d mu d mu is the dimension of the representation mu so you can also put instead of d mu you can also write this as d nu but it won't make any difference because whether you put d mu or d nu you have a delta function over here kronecker delta so that kronecker delta tells you that this right left hand side is non zero only when the two representations are the same okay so now we have the for the regular representation we have this this character uh, vector right so we we take all the elements all the characters for each element of the group right and then we just take the inner product of this so we can write this as a vector let's say we take the inner product of this vector of both of these with the character vector of some other representation new okay so on the right hand side what you will get is summation of g chi nu g star chi g where this is the character in the regular representation is equal to summation of mu a mu then another summation of g chi nu g star chi nu g now this quantity on the left on the right hand side we can use the or group orthogonality theorem to write it as g times d mu times delta mu nu and in the right hand side we have a sum over mu so when we sum over mu what do we get we get g d nu right times a nu okay what what do we get on the left hand side on the left hand side remember that the characters of the identity element is equal to the order of the group and the character of all the other group elements is zero in the regular representation so in the regular representation we can write the character the character table as order of the group and then everything else is zero okay so when you when you take this inner product over here on the left hand side you will get only one non zero element that will correspond to the when g is the identity right so here g is the identity so when g is the identity what do we get on the on the left hand side uh we have uh chi nu of the identity now what is chi nu of the identity it's so it's going to be equal to the dimension of the representation nu right so on the left hand side what we will get is we will get chi nu times order of g so that will give us order of g and chi nu 
is d nu. Okay. Um, yeah, I've made some mistake here. I think this d nu should not be there. So this. This will just be delta mu. Nu. So let me correct that over here. It's not there. Right? So from this expression, we can see that A nu is equal to D nu. Right? So the representation matrices of the regular representation in this regular representation each representation right occurs exactly how many times as many times as the represent the dimensionality of that representation so We'll, let's look at an example of this. For example, we'll again look at this uh, dihedral group D3. Okay. Now, how many representations does D3 have? D3 has three representations. There is the trivial representation. where all the group elements are mapped to the identity. Then there is one more one dimensional representation. And then there is a two dimensional representation. So I'll call this D1 prime. So D1, D1 prime and D2. And what are the dimensions of these representations? This is one dimensional. This is one dimensional and this is two dimensional. So if we ask the following question, and what is the order of the group? The order of D3 is the number of elements of the group, right? Now, the number of elements, what are the elements of the group? Uh, you have the identity, you have a rotation around the X axis, you have two rotations around the X axis, and you have three reflections, right? These are the elements. So the order of this group, right, is six, okay? So then this will also be the dimension of the regular representation of the group, right? Now, according to this result that we have just found over here, in the regular representation, uh, one second. So, in this regular representation, So let's just remind ourselves what these representations are, okay? We have this, we have the table that we worked out some lectures ago. Right? So this is what the representations and the characters of this group look like. Copy that. OK. 
Okay. I'll put that on a new page. So these are the representations of D3, right? This is the trivial representation where every element is mapped to the identity. The second one is a one dimensional representation where these three elements, the rotations and the identity are mapped to one and the three reflections are mapped to minus one. The dimension of both of these representations is one because there is only a one dimensional matrix, right? Then the non-trivial representation of D3, right, is the, consists of these elements and this is a two-dimensional representation. Okay. Now, what we want to do is, first we want to construct the character table of the group. Okay, so what is, what is the character table? It's the following. We list all of the, um, let's see. Right. The character table is as follows. In each column, you put the different elements of the group. Okay, these are the different elements of the group. And in each row, you put the different characters. Okay. Oh, no, my mistake. Not, not the elements of the group, you put what are called the conjugacy classes. You put the conjugacy classes, and I'll tell you in a minute what the conjugacy classes are. And in the row, in, in the rows, you put the character. So what are these conjugacy classes? Remember that if you have any group element, you can conjugate it with another group element. Uh, let me call that H. And how do you, the conjugation gives you another group element, which is given by X times G times H inverse. Now, under this conjugation operation, what happens to the representation D of G, right? D of G goes to D of H, G, and times H inverse. But according to the group multiplication property, we know that this is equal to D of H times D of G times D of H inverse. And now, if you take the trace of both of these, of trace of G and the conjugated element, what you find is that they are equal. Right? From the cyclic property of the trace. So this tells you that all elements of a group that are related by this conjugation have the same character. 
okay and this is true for finite groups infinite groups for any group it doesn't matter and we refer to all the elements which have the same character as belonging to a conjugacy class so if you have any group i have some group g i can always partition this group into uh disjoint sets so I, i have some group elements over here in this set some group elements in this set and so on and in each set what i know is the following so for instance here if i have two elements g1 and g2 then g2 is equal to the conjugate of g1 with respect to some element of the group all right so we this allows us to partition the group into a bunch of different disjoint sets and these are called the conjugacy classes okay now in this character table here in the columns we list the conjugacy classes so let me just list them like this c1 c2 and c3 and so on these are the conjugacy classes and then in the rows we list the uh we list the characters no sorry we list the uh, representation so the rows correspond to the irreducible representations for example for the group d3 how many representations are there there is one representation which is the trivial representation there is the non trivial representation which is the um which is also one dimensional so let me just put those over here well and then there is the two dimensional representation right and for each representation you will have the corresponding characters right now the characters of all the elements in a single conjugacy class by definition they are the same so i can make a list over here in this array of the character and the conjugacy class okay so this is called the group character table now so for d3 what are the conjugacy classes that is what we have to understand next conjugacy classes of the group d3 now d3 has three elements right sorry six elements e r r square and t1 t2 and t3 right and uh, what are the conjugacy classes well what you have to do is you have to find out which elements are equivalent to each other via conjugation right so that means 
that let me take for instance uh, the identity element right the identity element is always in its own conjugacy class okay why is that because if you take any element of the root and you take the complement of the identity of the root this is element h what we get this is the identity which in verse e and this just becomes equal to the identity again right so the identity of any element of any group is conjugate to itself right so there is one conjugacy class which contains the identity element and nothing else this is true for any group okay so this is one conjugacy class what about the other elements we have r r square t1 t2 and t3 now it's a matter of sitting down and just working out the relationships so what do we have to find out let's take any two group elements let's take r and r square and let's conjugate r square with respect to r okay so that means we take r r square and r inverse what this is the conjugate of r square with respect to r right now what is this going to be this is just going to be equal to r cube um times once again um this is going to be r square what about the other way around what if i take the conjugation of of r with respect to r square right if i write this expression what do i get i get r cube times r square inverse what is that going to be that's equal to r right so these two elements r and r square they belong to the second conjugacy class okay now so the reason is that r is um equivalent to itself via conjugation through r square and vice versa okay and then the remaining three elements they form the third conjugacy class so this i will leave for you as a exercise so d3 has three conjugacy classes let me call this c1 c2 and c3 and how many representations does it have it has three representations d1 d2 and d3 and we want to find the characters of the group of the different conjugacy classes in each in each of these representations right now in the trivial representation all of the elements are just the identity right so the character table is just one just gives you 1 1 1 right because all the three 
conjugacy classes will just give you one right in the two dimensional representation in the sorry in the non trivial representation what is the character table we can just read it off from here this is the this is the character table uh, sorry the not the character table but the characters for the one dimensional representation for identity it is one for r and r square it is one and for the reflections it is minus one So I get one, one, and minus one. What about the the two-dimensional representation? Here the character for the identity is two. For R and R two, the character is minus one, and for T one, T two, and T three, the character is zero. And by the way, if you didn't know anything about conjugacy classes, if you just saw this character table. this character table this table would tell you that these two elements they have the same character and since they have the same character they have to be related by a conjugation and these three have to be related by conjugation and this is so if you didn't know anything about conjugacy classes by looking at this kind of a uh, a list of characters you would be able to understand that each uh, group element lands up in a separate conjugacy class so you get 2 minus 1 and 0 right so this is the character table of d3 of the group d3 okay um now now what we want to do is we want to ask the question are there any other representations that we have missed out right is there any is there any three dimensional representation or some four dimensional representation of this group okay so what we can do now is we can go back to our result that we obtain from the regular representation and we'll come back and see what that result tells us okay so this result tells us after i take the trace that the uh, character of the regular representation is equal to this sum on the right hand side right now what i can do is i can take set g is equal to the identity if i set g is equal to identity then in the regular representation the character of the identity is what it's equal to the order of the group g so in this case it's equal to 6 right and on the right hand side i have summation over new new is the number of representations so which representations do i have well i have my trivial representation what is the dimensionality of that representation it's 1 and what is the character of the of the group element of the identity the character is 1 okay then i have uh my uh second representation which is also one dimensional and the character of the identity is also one and then i have my last 
at least the one that I think is my last, my two dimensional representation. And the character of the identity is two. Right? What is this equal to? Two times two is four plus one plus one is six. Right? So this tells me that these are all the possible representations, all the possible irreducible representations of D3, right? You can't have any other representations. Why is that? Because if you had any other representations in this, then you would have to include them in this sum. If you included them in this sum, then you would get a number here on the right hand side, which was greater than the order of the group. And that is not allowed because of the property of this regular representation, right? So this is one way in which you can determine how many representations there should be and what should be the dimensionality of those representations. Okay, and I think um, I'll stop here for today. Uh, from tomorrow's class, I will start talking about Lie groups and the algebra. And then I will come back in um, to this problem that I started talking about yesterday about finding uh, the these. Uh, irreducible representations of a tensor product. Uh, and we'll come to this along the way. When, when, once we start talking about the groups and the answers. And I will stop it here for now because I think that this is all that anybody has any appetite for. Okay. All right, so if there are any questions, please ask. Otherwise, I will see you all tomorrow in the morning. Okay.